Hello, everybody. This is Ng. I'm just going to give people um, a little bit of time to trickle in, but welcome to the talk. And if you're coming in, uh, just you can put a chat message in there. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to see that. Um, and we'll get started in just a little bit, but we want to give people time to get into the room. So hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I know. Happy, happy Wednesday. Um, we have about, we have a lot of people registered, so we're just going to wait for Zoom to catch up with everybody. All right. Give it a few more seconds. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm tuning in here from the Boston area, from Brookline, Massachusetts. And um, for those who may not know me, my name is Ingru Chen, and I am the founder and the owner of Prey Shadows Art Gallery in Boston, Massachusetts, in Brookline, technically Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, I'm really, really honored and um, thrilled, actually, to have both Jean Shin and Ava Raspini here with us tonight to speak about the, the current exhibition at the gallery called Second Skin. And um, we're going to have a one hour program where the two of them will discuss their almost 20 year um, history of having worked together and um, an upcoming project that they are also going to be working on together. And we'll have a really amazing glimpse into um, the current exhibition, which is a bod a two bodies of work that have come from recent public art installations. So I'll get started with um, brief introductions and uh, into each of their bios, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ava to uh, start the program. We will let you ask questions in the chat, so feel free to put some questions in there, but I leave it up to the two of them, especially Ava, to decide on whether and when um, these questions will be addressed. So hopefully you will be a lucky recipient of an answer, but um, we can't promise because we do want to end right on time. So I'm going to start with Jean Shin. Um, Jean was born in Seoul, South Korea, and raised in the United States. She works in Brooklyn and Hudson Valley, New York. She is a tenured adjunct professor at Pratt Institute and holds an honorary degree from New York Academy of Art. Jean's work has been widely exhibited and collected in over 150 major museums and cultural institutions, including solo exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C., and Asian Art Museum in, in sorry, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, where in 2020, she was the first Korean American woman artist featured in a solo exhibition. Shin has received numerous awards, including the Frederick Church Award for her contributions to American art and culture. Thank you, Jean, for being here. Next, we'll talk a little bit about Ava Raspini. Um, and I'm just so thrilled, and I, I miss Ava already from for uh, being in Boston, but um, many of you will know Ava was the curator and co-commissioner of the historic and critically acclaimed presentation of Simone Lee at the U.S. Pavilion for the 59th Venice Biennale, as well as the former Barbara Lee chief curator at the ICA Boston from 2015 until 2023. She was curator at the Museum of Modern Art for over a decade, where she organized numerous exhibitions of contemporary art and photography. Raspini has been a visiting lecturer, critic, and speaker at a number of universities, and recently taught a seminar on curatorial practice at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Other universities where she has taught and lectured include School of Visual Arts, Columbia University, Yale's University School of Art, and the School of Visual Arts, New York. She has published numerous books and catalogs, and her writing appears in museum publications and periodicals. Um, so this exhibition, Second Skin, is on view through July 23rd. We'll be putting more information in the chat. And um, at the moment, I will hand it over to you, Ava. Thank you so much. Great. 
Thank you, Ng. Hi, Jean. Hi, everyone. We are really thrilled that you're here. Just looking at the list of participants, a lot of um, familiar names. So thanks for spending your Wednesday evening with us. Um, we were actually just joking that the Zoom talk is a little bit of a, a throwback to pandemic days. Um, I'm sorry we can't all be together in person, um, but I'm currently uh, not near Brookline, but I'm really happy we can all be here together. Um, so as you heard from Ng, um, Jean and I have known each other a long time. Uh, about two decades. And um, we're gonna start the conversation talking about really how we first worked together as a way to kind of unpack Jean's practice. And then we'll move on to talking about um, the show that's currently on view at Praise Shadows. Um, so Jean and I first worked together um, in 2004 on a projects exhibition that I organized at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and I'd love for you, Jean, to maybe you can share your screen because there's some great images from, from that show that we did together. When I was a young curator, you were really an artist coming into your own in terms of your practice. Um, I thought maybe we could start with that in terms of not only our work together, but looking at a 20 year span of your practice. Um, so just tell us about that exhibition, which really was, I would say your first major solo museum exhibition. Well, thank you um, both. It's been just such a pleasure, of course, um, to have known you for so long and really just looking back at, wow, it really has been 20 years. And, um, you know, this exhibition was so meaningful for me, um, being an emerging artist and it being the first solo show. And we have this history, of course, working in institutions. Um, so it really grounds my practice in so many ways and what I learned. And I think we were just chatting earlier about like, how did I think that I could pull off a major exhibition of the scale? Like it's enormous like vessel, the threshold to go into this museum. And I learned that from, you know, my predecessors of working, you know, as an assistant at Soloit, putting together major exhibitions from behind the scene uh, as a curatorial person, as a studio assistant, you know, and I think those ideas of like things are possible in a collective, things are possible with a group of people. And so the Museum of Modern Art show was really talking about our lives at that time, you know, which was, you know, as a cultural worker, you know, um, and then to sh have that shift of lens where then I become the featured artist, you know, and I kind of question like, what does that mean really? Like I am just part of the ecosystem, right? Um, I'm featured one day, another artist who's an art handler may have another show, it might be, you know, and so I just felt like I wanted to understand this body, the, the community that we were in. Um, but the workplace as well. And in many ways, when I think of this show, I mean, it was like MoMA in a uh, moment of identity crisis, right? Could MoMA, you know, be deconstructed going through this major renovation capital campaign, you know, and then move and shift and be in Queens, you know? So this is not um, PS1, but just another transitory space. It was beautiful. It was dynamic. It was in Queens. It's amazing, right? But for MoMA, who is traditionally been in Midtown, uh, I think it displaced people. It made people feel sort of uncomfortable. There were certainly layoffs. Um, and it started to question um, a lot of that um, about what and who is MoMA and who is it for? And uh, I think it happened from the view viewers, but it also happened internally. And um, I, I think that the prompt of my asking you, well, you know, uh, it's our bodies, it's our spirit, it's our employment, it's our, it's, it's for some of us our sanctuary to go to these museums. So it made us uh, question this place as an institution, but also uh, a group of people. So I asked you um, if I could get an article of work clothes um, or something that you would donate to the project and that the, these would be collage elements that would deconstruct the fashion elements as a garment, you know, bring it back to its pattern and then the scenes would be above and it would be hanging and then each of these clothes are so special because they represent the people um, who work there um, and then you were charged as my kind of like ambassador to go and meet and convince people to donate one of their clothing um, and I think that looking back on it it 
was looking at the hierarchies, you know, of workplace too, um, and the divisions, even though we were all under this umbrella, MoMA, um, we all had different histories, and we all had different pays, and we had different, you know, um, on the grounds experience or behind the office experience, um, or um, named for that work, or invisible, you know, um, and so this was sort of my, you um, group portrait of uh, the institution, both in its beauty, because I love working there and I love working in museums, but also um, its fragmentation, you know, that it is porous and that it is vulnerable and that it can break apart in many ways. Um, so those are the thoughts I had. And of course, you know, for me as a uh, a first, I, I wanted to take on that ambitious scale. I wanted it to be in a space that was not traditionally a gallery. So no one had claimed this as a proper gallery. And I love that it was not seen as valuable, you know, and it was just a hallway, but it was like the lobby, you know, it was the most accessible. You almost didn't have to pay admissions to just be lingering in this lobby space. And I just wanted that. Um, I also wanted to move from just found objects, which was my trajectory, like finding things on the street. And this was a collaboration with you, you know, a collaboration with every single person who's a participant. And I thought of that as a mis material exchange. Uh, so it was really pivotal and how to reset my practice. And it really has changed so much because of your invitation and your trust in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, for me, when I look back on this and, and thinking and hearing you talk, you know, at the heart of this, this is also about labor, right? The labor of the individuals who donated their item of clothing and, you know, maybe those items of clothing are coded, right? Like who gets to wear jeans, who has to wear a suit, you know, if you're in the finance department, as opposed to in the frame shop, I know that you and I had a lot of conversations where we wanted to make sure that those individuals that worked at MoMA that required wearing a uniform, a guard or someone working in facilities was represented um, you know, in this collage or portrait of the workforce as well. And that kind of this notion of creating this collective portrait of labor um, is something that to me feels very related to a lot of the work you know you've been making since and and just to say also your labor as an artist i remember the installation it's very labor intensive i mean not only have you prepared and and disassembled all of these clothes prior in your studio but actually collaging them on the wall you know took a fair amount of labor um, we had a team to help you um, and the effect was such that when you walk through that hallway that sort of interstitial space you were talking about you know you I felt you really could feel and see the labor of the artist as well as the labor workforce that you were cho choosing to highlight and one thing that you alluded to but I just wanted to maybe make more clear is that in fact you and I I first met when I was your intern and you were a curatorial assistant at the Whitney Museum, um, which, yeah, I, you know, hopefully I can share that bit of information, but just to say, coming back to the, this notion of a cultural worker, right, and the labor of museums that so often museums seem like these monoliths, you know, who works there, who's making the decision, who, who is sitting around the table, but at the end of the day, it's a community of individuals that make these programs happen that make exhibitions happen from the art handlers to the curators to the press folks that get the word out there. Um, you know, and of course, the artist at the center of all of that. So I think it's interesting that you and I sort of started within that, you know, our relationship started within the cultural um, you know, workforce sphere, and then, you know, um, migrated into that, this, you know, really great dialogue between artist and curator, and, you know, what was essentially my first show as well as a curator. Um, the one thing that you and I were talking about just before everyone logged on is we were reminiscing on what other exhibitions were on view at this time. And as you mentioned, Jean, this was when um, MoMA was in Queens during the first renovation of 53rd Street or a previous renovation, not the 2000, the most recent one, this was the one around 2004, 2005. So this temporary space, um, you know, there was a big challenge in getting people to come there. And so they did a number of shows that were, you know, very visible, highly visible from the collection. But one show that they did do that was concurrent with part of your presentation was the Lee Bontecue show. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about what that meant to you and the connections you saw between your work and 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 her work being presented. 
Oh, yeah. And I was, I mean, thrilled, right, to see one of my favorite artists who works in fabric and these like salvage things that are both painting and sculpture, which is my history. You know, I was trained as a painter, but I moved into installation in these public works. And so to see this incredible um, female artist, right, that had such powerful, forceful, uh, you know, works that you had to reckon with, you know, and they were dark. And um, I just love them in, in ways. Um, it was a delight also to see a long life of an artist tra trajectory all in one place, you know, and to see the major shifts and evolutions of her work and how profound her engagement with the art world had also traumatized her to retreat and go someplace and, and then make these kind of works more privately that were then shown later in her life, right? Um, and they seemed really a very different um, kind of caliber, like playful and light and material really, really, um, you know, uh, delighting and kind of a universal kind of place. And I you know, I think we talk about the evolution of my practice and going places that were very urban, which is kind of our trajectory, you know, to things of the street, to architecture, you know, to structure, to the body within, and then to be like, okay, I'm in nature, I'm floating and moving in space very differently. So um, I still think about how important that show was to me. And of course, what an honor to have both works presented at the same time. Um, yeah, like fragments and structure, like architecture, there's so much rich dialogue. Um, I want to also mention, it's it's interesting, the different roles that you and I've had, we, we started in a different museum, <laughs> you know, and then uh, the many institutions that we've overlapped in as well. And, and that kind of relationship, right, our roles changed right? We're the same people, but our statuses change. And then we never held power as one of those things that was uh, uh, important to our relationship. It was really about the work and the delight of being in dialogue about interesting art and looking at things together and unpacking that. I mean, that was my relationship with you. It wasn't because, you know, I was a curatorial assistant and you were an intern, right? And now you're the artist, and, uh, I'm the artist and you're the curator. It's like, it, these roles change. And that's what I wanted to talk about, the fluidity of our identity and the different roles and, um, and and responsibilities that we have to each other you know? yeah yeah and just one thing to say about also what it physically did this installation for me and for those of you you know on this call that maybe didn't get a chance to see it is it also infused the museum with a kind of softness or tactility um, you know the MoMA Queen space was an old swing line staple factory that was renovated you know it was a very kind of industrial hard edge space and you know as you were talking about Bontecu I was thinking you know this notion of this experience I remember of walking down that hallway you know being surrounded by clothing that were on people's bodies right like a kind of index of the body disassociated but still an index of the body with also the kind of ghostly remnants above you know this notion of a kind of um memory of the body the imprint of the body um you know through textiles through the kind of gentle hanging of the elements above did infuse the the space with a little bit of kind of softness and um and speak and sort of humanity in a way um, that I I really enjoyed and thinking about what your work in general does that there's a kind of accessibility in the materials that you use um, in that they're everyday materials everybody has clothes everybody understands you know this material sort of intuits it um, and so maybe that's a bridge if we can to sort of fast forward now 20 years but just maybe if you could talk sort of generally why you are interested in working with materials that have had a previous life and that have had a use in the world. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful question. And, and it is true, these seams seem ghostly. There's like a soft structure, a ceiling that it kind of comes at you and embraces you, fills the architecture. Um, and it's true that a lot of my objects are 
um, recognizable and yet transformed, you know, and I think the transformation happens in labor and this like labor intensive work, but also I give a hint and it's tactile, it's, it's literally the material, um, but then it is transformed in scale by the sheer accumulation, right? And so there's another labor that isn't your own, right? So you can say, oh, I know this, this is my thing, whether it's a, it's a piece of clothing or uh, a Mountain Dew bottle that you might've used or cell phone, it's, it's your thing and it, it feels very intimate, right? Mm -hmm. And you know it inside out and you have such shared histories or you passed it on. And I think there's a nostalgia to these things in our lives, you know? There's literally the feeling of, oh, I know what that worn surface is all about. You know, and it's attached to a memory. It's attached to literally a story, something that you can laugh at or mourn, right? And um, so I just feel like, like no space is neutral, right? So we talk about like the white cube, and it's like, well, it's that's not even neutral, right? But we think of the blank canvas. It's really not, you know. Uh, but that the minute that this exhibition leaves, something else is coming, and something else has predated, you know. And that's why I was talking about this legacy of another artist too. You know, these spaces are really loaded. They're ghosts, you know, that whisper to us like angels or haunt us. Um, and I do think that everyday object just does that naturally. It brings us together. Um, because we have this shared experience with this everyday object. Um, I think they also then talk about consumerism <laughs> and it has in 20 years escalated so dramatically in time of Amazon and time of, you know, click, click, click. And, you know, all our social media is just trying to give us the data to buy more things and consume our time, you know? So it's so it's such a different space than we were in uh, um, today and the object flow and the kind of a global export and import um, the movement of objects and its discards have just been overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's interesting that throughout your practice, you've also had the opportunity to work outside of the museum context and you've, you know, recently done, you know, some pretty big public art commissions or art within the public realm. And in fact, your your show at Praise Shadows are related um, to two such large commissions. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that because you know you mentioned scale. It's about accumulation. A lot of your work is about accumulation, but here we have a scale that is, you know, I mean, to compete with the outdoors, especially in the Hudson Valley, is a hard thing to do, but you pulled it off and, and really responding to the landscape and responding to the history. Um, so maybe you could just talk us through, you know, this project. Uh, and then when we jump to the gallery images, people can see that that relationship. Yeah, thank you. So this scale is the scale of a tree. And we think about architecture having this massive presence, but really trees do too. And they're actually bigger than skyscrapers and so on. And the history of them, this tree is 140 years old. And that to me is the kind of space like architecture is, is hard to um, even imagine, um, even at the Museum of Modern Art, you know. Um, so this one tree um, lived in Frederick Church's estate and his home and his studio. And I love this idea of the plein air, you know, this observation of nature working outdoors. So I really did my labor there uh, during the pandemic time. The tree had fallen, it was dying. And I really just wanted to present it almost to the public, this dying tree, um, and to present the cycle of life. Of course, we were experiencing the pandemic. So I think this analogous relationship of like, suffering and grieving for things that we just, it wasn't tactile to us, you know, and things didn't seem safe. And meanwhile, these hemlock trees um, that existed in the Catskills, there were so many of them. Uh, and that's why the tanneries in the 1800s moved and literally deforested everything and destroyed the hemlocks. And Frederick Church decided to replant them because he saw the horrors literally in front of him, this industrialization taking over this beautiful mountain uh, full of trees. And, um, um, what they did was peel these trees. And um, I just, when I saw this historic research, um, I was like, oh my God, not only did they just use the trees, but the kind of way they, the violence, you know, in which you peel the skin, the protective layer, and the tree just instantly dies, you know. Um, and there was no use for the tree because um, the hemlocks are a little difficult because they have so many limbs and carpenters don't want to use them. And, you know, so they were just left um, to, to die. And I just wanted to give them a, 
dignified death. Um, but I also first wanted to uh, acknowledge the violence that this tree and its ancestors had had. Uh, so we debarked it with the tools um, used, um, which was these little steel um, um, very small hand tools that could peel a tree in minutes. Um, and then I created this uh, shroud, this custom coat, the second skin for them. And uh, these are all used leathers um, from the, the fashion industry, but also the in upholstery industry. And I realized how incredible it was that there was so much waste on both sides. You know, these encounters of a calf, an animal, and a tree would never have happened except we force this violence on them with such devastation to both um, ecological spaces. Um, so afterwards, the exhibition, um, you know, I removed the shroud and thought in terms of preparing the body, the body needs to go to cremation and that I would hold this remnant, which was now sacred for me uh, because it literally held the memories, the last memories of this tree. Um, and so then we had a burning, which was our final cremation goodbye to the tree, it went back to a different form, literally transformed into ashes and returned to the landscape. And then the only thing left to me uh, to hold on to was that leather. And what was so beautiful was the leather and the tree had both been transformed by the time it was together. Um, so the sun bleaching it and making rings around it um, um, almost um, kind of the uh, patterning that was done, done through time. So it captured itself, uh, that embrace. And then this other project, um, when I moved from Hudson Valley to an invitation in Philadelphia, it was Delaware River that was the site. Um, and when I thought of like, oh, here's another industrialization, but also in the 1800s, you know, it was a major port city. The river was so important, um, but the history of the river is something that we think of as, as, you know, for ourselves, an important port city to Philadelphia, but there was all this ecological, you know, habitats habit happening underneath. So these are uh, pictures of pearl buttons, um, another object that uh, was so important to us and so valuable that we decided to literally destroy the whole ecosystem um, by wanting and creating these beautiful uh, remnants of fashion for our clothing. Um, I worked on a pier, so it allowed me to pump the Delaware River through what I call the fountain. And the fountain was a series of vessels and bone glass, and each of them would have um, these freshwater mussels that I worked in collaboration with the, um, the water department and they were uh, creating hatcheries and breeding these mussels. Um, and then I found these vintage pearl buttons and it was my luck to imagine this whole warehouse full of them that had been extracted from the landscape historically, boxed in these beautiful buttons, but never even worn, never seen, and just kept there until it, it was no longer in fashion because of plastics. And so I wanted these two kind of um, moments where the historical you know, the ghost ancestors are looking up at these vessels and the freshwater mussels that have been bred in a laboratory are looking down, you know, and experiencing this recollection of loss um, and uh, the, the need to kind of regenerative spaces of like, how can the ecosystem do this, you know, and um, our responsibility to that. Um, a kind of different morning and with the water flowing down from it, it really did seem like a sadness um, to this fountain. Uh, and yet there was hope that somehow these mussels would survive the toxicity and they would filter the water and give us fresh water. And in fact, what was so beautiful, just like Fallen, was that nature took over. You know, the minute the water took that space, not only did the uh, mussels thrive by the nutrients of the water, but the algae growth really transformed it. It wasn't just clean water, but other uh, um, habitats were kind of living in this ecosystem. So it turned it day glow. And I just love that, you know, every single time you think of uh, bringing witness to something, something else beautiful happens as a consequence when nature intervenes. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out to everyone on the call that Ing is putting some really great resources in the chat of uh, great articles, and I would encourage everyone as you have questions as Jean's talking, please just put them in the chat and I'm happy to to voice those questions. Um, I mean, there's a lot 
there's a lot to unpack in those two projects, but you know, the thing that you know clearly unites them is you know both projects speak to how nature was really you know seen as for the taking you know a few hundred years ago not even that long ago actually and you know both of these projects and you've used this word are kind of mourning for the the loss of these natural resources but it seems like you're also participating in a kind of restoration if you will i mean clearly with the philadelphia project there is a restoration but even the way in which you've cared so um or you've taken such good care of that fallen tree right uh, down to its you know final resting place if you will um i just wanted to understand from you whether you see your work as part of a dialogue around activism and how that might participate in in conversations um, you know, around social justice or ecological justice um, and how you see your role as an artist in those, in that discourse. Mm. Well, well um, wow, the, the kind of repair is really interesting and conservation is interesting. You know, as an artist, we think about creating something and transforming it, but I also think about other roles when conservators come and things need repair. And I just love that, right? I was so, so also trained in that art historical look at what conservation work does so for me an artist can do both right i can create new things but i also could be repairing something but some things aren't repairable like what we did to nature like it's hard to go back to right uh, but yes we i am my work is kind of thinking about second third fourth lives of these things and how it could be different right and we really respect the cycles of life we're also thinking in terms of how we're contributing to it you know uh, so not just taking um but really creating this kind of regenerative space. And so activism to me is like the social responsibility, right? Stewards of being with nature, living in it, right? Means that we um, hold ourselves accountable, right? To our actions and our living uh, habitats and our consumerism. So um, to me, like the social activism is really um, thinking about environmental justice or climate justice even, you know? So it is all of those things. Um, what do we do uh, in our own practices that um, also are paradoxically taking from nature and, 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 and insect accelerating the carbon footprint, you know? And then what could we do in our work that could contribute to um, a more regenerative space or a more sustainable space or to combat climate change, right? So all these things, you know, the hemlock dying of a, um, the invasive species, woolly ad adelgid, you know, it's part of the climate change right it's it's our generation's um witness of hemlocks dying but very very slowly that we don't even notice you know or that we give up because we say it's inevitable you know and so species are being lost every day and then how do we even account for that right and so i do feel like i i'm um repairing but also just holding as many of them as possible and also amplifying the work of all these other people, you know, the ecologists and the water department scientists who are collecting the data. Um, they need the data set, but yet um, it's hard to connect with the data set, you know? So the visual impact of what I do, which is large scale and, you know, um, I think, in compelling, a tactile, um, unassuming, brings people in to really feel it for themselves, to be moved by what's happening. Uh, and then of course, there's an incredible data that you can read and, and, and the research that's going on. So I feel like I'm working with um, all these incredible people who are in this fight together. Um, and that's kind of my role as a catalyst and, and a way to mobilize these very different fields in the same cause. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought in this notion of community because one of the things that I think you do so well as an artist and that your work, and especially with these two projects, and I'm thinking specifically about Fallen, is that you create a community around 
your pieces just by the fact that you need many people to work on them. You need people to donate the items, you know, from the get go and to install them from the get go. A lot of people have to participate. I mean, I remember in that MoMA project, I literally was going to people's offices who had never met before, you know, in departments that I didn't always, you know, uh, interface with and said, you know, would you have an extra item of clothing that you could donate to this? And that formed a certain kind of, you know, community in and of itself. But with the Fallen project, you had, I mean, I think this notion of community of gathering of ritual, maybe if I could say, um, was very strong. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that. And, you know, one of the things that you and I discussed a little while ago, and I love this, is that the scholar and academic Suzette Min said that you quote, build imaginary communities. So this notion of the different kinds of community that you build, if not quite literally through the people that you bring together to make the pieces, but also even in the objects themselves. So I'd love to just hear you talk a little bit more about that. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you had that firsthand experience, right? So uh, by my prompt, you have to traverse your own comfort zone with a community that is probably like your office and your coworker. But now you have to go to departments that maybe is an email, but or never seen because their time and your workflow doesn't interact in a physical space, you know? So the imaginary community is like transcending those boundaries, right? Physical offices here, or there, time, space, you know? Um, but it's also thinking in terms of like, imagining like this invitation, I think, to be together, to be, to have a shared experience um, that one might not think of at first, right? Um, so to me, creating a community or imagining that community, oftentimes people say like, are you reaching out to? And I'm like, we're all here. <laughs> you don't need to reach out to quote diversity or uh, social economic, you know, uh, accessible, you know, it's, we're all here. You just don't acknowledge them as part of the community, right? So it's really about um, this kind of access point um, of who you think is here and part of that belonging. Um, and then for me, um, when you mention rituals, right, we're also transcending intergenerational things. You know, I think of my ghost who, who I haunts me in a beautiful way as my grandmother, right? And I think of rituals that inform our histories together and time together. And so she's no longer here. But when I reenact like Korean dump dumpling making or having uh, ceremonies of some sort, I think of her and I feel like I embody that through the way of making and reenacting. And every single time I make a dumpling, you know, every year I think of her, right? Um, so that is, again, connecting us to people who are not even here, right? But that we're descendants of and that we're honoring, you know? So I, I think of different ways rituals um, help us connect to our history and to define our identity. Um, and when I think about community building, it is about like, yes, you're an individual and you matter and your history matters, but you're also part of something that exists that's greater than ourselves. And that this collective sense of belonging is something uh, that really grounds us, that makes us feel um, really alive, right? You know, and I think uh, rituals do that. Um, and I think that the more I, I think about my practice, why it's so labor intensive is to try to prompt a sort of a gathering, a ritual of making, and to share my creative process, right? And a lot of people aren't working with their hands very much and aren't able to experience something that they see go from nothing and then turned into something fabulous, you know, something meaningful. And it's not meaningful because of the objecthood, it's meaningful because of their time invested in doing that work and that's all all right so rituals are time with someone with others well i've always been impressed by the fact that you know how to do everything right you're sewing you're stitching you're hammering you're you know putting it all together you are physically doing the labor and i will say a lot of the labor you're doing is has traditionally been seen as sort of domestic or you know female labor right in terms of a lot of these uh, domestic, you know, kinds of the stitching together and things like that. And I think it's important that you are doing that labor. Oftentimes, you, you know, whether it's studio assistants or others, you know, coming in to do that labor. Um, and, you know, there's lots of great pictures of you, you know, um, amidst, you know, these huge, when, when you look at them, these installations that take hours, I mean, it's clear they take hours, right? And that 
kind of goes back to what we were just talking about in the beginning with the MoMA project that for me, labor is very much at the heart of sort of, you know, what you do and making that visible, right? You know, interesting, Ava, you mentioned the Fallen Project and labor. Um, and now, you know, I can, well, like, like sewing buttons, right? That takes so much time. Like it is. So of course I have a team of people that I trust who are really good at this and we figure it out and you get just better and better and better. So even if you don't know at first, you can be taught and through experience, you're just an expert on that. And after hundreds of hours, you were truly an expert on that. But there are certain labors that I don't, um, want to pass on, right? So as I have learned, like in the beginning, I needed that labor. So yes, let's mobilize and do this. But now I have a choice. And sometimes that fallen, like when I did those tack, tacking works, the leather upholstery tacks, I really wanted to spend time by myself with this tree. And it was a solitary labor, you know? And people said, oh, do you need help? And I was like, I don't really know what the next move is. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be here with it to mm -hmm. the tree's going to tell me where the next tack goes. And I love that time there. Mm -hmm. So some things are, are not just farmed out or just like, I love the hand and I have this beautiful team of people who work with me. Um, and I trust that, but other times it's like, Oh no, this part, I just want to honor and do by myself. And I yeah. think that's important. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of good questions in the chat, and now might be a good time to, to bring those forward. Um, Maggie Adler is interested in um, your teaching practice, and specifically, um, they are asking, do your students embrace the type of research you cherish, or is that something you stress primarily in your work and less so in teaching? Hmm. Wow, Maggie, that's a really... <laughs> well, for me... Um... You know, you're in dialogue, right? And so I, I ask, what are you in dialogue with? You know, what do you care about? And so some students will care about different things, right? But then I say, like, you have to understand your subject, you know? And so for some, that is the deep research, right? And others, it is like firsthand interviews, the now, right? And to get to know through other people. And sometimes it's material, you know? So I don't have a hierarchy on that. My process is a little bit of both, right? Sometimes I'm lucky and I get pearl buttons, wonderful. <laughs> and now I have labor intensive work to put into fountain. Um, it, right before that, I was like, where's my hand in the work? Mm -hmm. I trusted the process, but I was like, where's the, the labor intensiveness, right? The, the muscles were doing that labor. Uh, but was that enough until I discovered this material that could not, uh, you know, I just was obsessed with in, in, in sewing them, right? And so I follow that thread. Um, so the material tells you what, where and how it wants to live, right? But I had known about this history because of the uh, depleted rivers in America and the, the native species being extinct. So there was a connection to me why they were uh, beautiful, not uh, because they were a button, but beautiful within our ecosystem and the history of loss, um, and that I wanted to remember them. Uh, I also wanted to bring them together. So in teaching, it's like, for me, a mentorship. Uh, so it's like letting them, you know, do what they want to do and allowing them. Um, the critical lens is I'm always asking questions. <laughs> I'm always asking, you know, um, what are the other ways in which we can understand the subject, understand your practice? Um, and sometimes they'll explore it and, and say, no, that wasn't where I want to land. And it's like, now you know, right? And that's the best thing. I always think that you have to play, play those scenes out. Um, and I feel like that is true uh, when I'm making site-specific work. There is a site and a community I'm responding to, obviously a budget a timeline, you know, and then when that is over, like when we got to reinfuse these new bodies of work, it's like, I get to recondition them. I get to send them more love in the studio, know that they will be indoors, you know? So there's a different kind of care um, and an intimacy that happens in the studio work, even after a major public work. Yeah. You know, you've uh, you've addressed one of the other questions in the chat that um, Ben Sloat asked, which is about your research practice in terms of approaching your projects, not just the literal history of a site, but the embedded histories within the materials that you respond to. And he asked, how does the shape or create shifts in the trajectory 
up the respective projects. You answered it a little bit, but maybe one of the things you could answer with this question is also then how do you translate? You were beginning to talk about that from a large project public realm to what we see at Praise Shadows, which are you know discrete objects in a gallery setting. And how do you approach that? Right, because um, the site is so beautiful and I want to honor that, right? I want the visitor to see the work, right? That's a, a really important criteria. Um, but then the materials, like in this work, um, this is going back to the leather. It's like, okay, the tree's no longer there, right? So, but then let's address the other body, right? The unspoken body there, you know, so then this calf in particular was so big that it wrapped around the actual stump area. So it was like literally the embrace. And I wanted to feel this body now that the tree is, is no longer and how it's been shaped and altered um, through sun exposure. You could feel the color shifts from being on the top of the tree to the side and underneath, you know? So that's when I felt, oh, it's going back to a different animal, you know, and that I would want it to be singular pieces that we experience this skin, not the tree, you know? Um, so. You know, I, I lived with the works for a long time and, I, you know, I had the opportunity in McDowell to, I, I had these shrouds and, and bags and I knew I wanted to see how they weathered and they were so beautiful. They were even more beautiful than I first started. Um, but you can see the change, like when a tack held that color and then when I removed it. You know, and then I would find a hole and it's the exact hole that I remember tacking, you know, so the body memory, like I have it, but the calf has it too, you know, and then so did the tree. So there's all these things that I feel like um, it arrives and I know it wants to be come, you know, yeah. and I also think it continues to become right. It's like many iterations later, like I went back and here I wanted to go back to like panel painting because these were fragments so no longer a whole body they didn't start they weren't a whole body to begin with so I couldn't um resurrect that so here I thought what does it mean to have a remnant you know and so then it's like the painting you know the this section of an altar piece there's like so precious there's only so little of it you know um and then to bring back some of the limbs um to um have a, that kind of Lee Bontague moment, right? <laughs> I was just thinking that as I was looking at these, talk about Bontague in terms of this otherworldly kind of landscape or, you know, this notion of, especially the previous ones where there are these voids, obviously, you know, she's so well known for creating those voids and, and the way in which she's shaping materials to create something new and different. I mean, I think there's definitely an echo of that here as well in these pieces. Totally. Um, and then these were the experiments that I do in the studio, trying to figure out that form. So I had proposed this big tree, but then the limbs, when we removed the limbs and just kept the body, I was like, oh, what are these arms? Well, I can do those experiments. Uh, they never were outdoors, so they didn't have the sun uh, transformation. So you see how bright these leather are, uh, pieces are, and they're gorgeous and they're tanning colored um, uh, existence as almost like consumer, so close to uh, the runway <laughs> and things that we find in our shops, um, our luxury goods. And here um, they become like limbs that I don't, you know, I don't have a site, they're vulnerable. So they lean, right? And then I also think in terms of, I call them SOS because while the body, I can't move, there's a massive two crane kind of shift to create that feeling of elevation, but it's massive. And so here I wanted the lightness of the touch, like the arms, like wailing and moving and signaling for help. Um, and that the question is, do we even understand to read the signs anymore, you know, when someone's putting smoke signals, is it, it just doesn't commute, right? So slow the signaling for help. Uh, and that's what's happening with climate change when it comes to like an invasive species that's eating it, you know, um, just this, this sap sucking kind of slowness uh, to the decay. Um, and it's gonna be decades um, of that, and then I have these other pre-existing works too um, from Materials for the Arts. When I was looking at the waste stream coming through uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sanitation, kind of looking at you know, the fashion waste, um, uh, the major houses contribute. So um, 
Pennant Lang, Chloe, all these beautiful seasons of fashion, every season. And then I really was like the evidence, you know, they extract the perfect thing in the middle, the prime spot, you know, and what they let go and they scarred are like literally life, you know, the stretch marks, the, you know, the um, literally scars um, and anything that is reminiscent of an animal, right? And so I love this idea that like, wow, fashion abstracts in ways that we call it leather, we don't call it flesh, we don't call it skin. Um, and so this was one of my early works and it really set the tone of why I was interested in Fallen because I've been looking at leather for so long uh, in different fashion ways, but also the extractive nature of our um, violence that we do to other things for our own kind of um, decor. And there's also this notion, I think, in you know so much of your work about making the unseen seen, right? Like you were just talking about uh, you know, what surrounds after this, you know, prime real estate on the leather has been extracted for, you know, a Michael Kors handbag or what have you, um, you know, sort of making visible the invisible or the undesirable, the cast off, the remnants, the discarded objects. And you and I had a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago where you were also talking about visibility and invisibility as an artist, as a member of a community. We talked about with Lee Bontecu, this was one of the first shows of, you know, many now that museums do of a kind of you know forgotten artist, usually a woman, usually already deceased, or you know very much um, has had a large uh, a career of making that you know has gone uh, relatively unseen. So I just wondered if you could tease out a little bit. Maybe I'm I'm being a little too far ranging and bringing things together, but this notion of visibility and invisibility, you know, as it relates to you as an artist, but also in your interest in making visible these things that have not always been visible, these, uh, these remnants and discards that are generally unseen, right? Well, um, thank you for that. It's a very big topic and we can go from the objecthood to culture or to even my personal history uh, or the art world, right? <laughs> um, but I do think it's about value, you know, and I do think it's about shifting that lens of what we value, right? Prime real estate, of course, more valuable. Anything else? Not, right? In fact, it can just be destroyed and there would be no infrastructure to say there's a need to save it, right? So I just want to think of it more holistically, right? Uh, so visibility is not a good or bad thing. Like sometimes, you know, I'm being Asian American, you know, it's that somewhere between like some people don't even recognize I'm a person of color or a minority, right? Or sometimes we're the majority, right? So, so th these paradox around naming that, right? And that it can slip from one to another. It's all about context, right? And sometimes I'll be in a space and people will be totally ignored. And other times when someone notices me, it doesn't actually become very helpful um, or it's misunderstood or it could be uh, a, a threat, you know? So um, we don't all wanna be visible, right? But I think it's about choosing to be visible and being acknowledged, right? As part of the ecosystem at large, the system at work, you know? And so um, when, the, when you see these things, it's like negative space versus positive space, you know, that those are connotations about good and judgment, you know? And I just want to um, shift that lens you know, what I'm presenting as the positives is the negative, the negative is positive, right? I've done nothing but collect them. I haven't altered them. The, the extractive process happened through fashion mm -hmm. because someone wanted to buy them. I'm sure that piece of leather cost thousands of dollars, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. It's produced and, and, and placed in a very fancy shop, right? Um, but what about this whole process? You know, what about the ecosystem and the, the animal, the landscape that of the tanning industry that happens elsewhere? You know, so it's all about these like value systems we place and really wanting to um, examine them, to question them. Um, I'm not promoting one or the other, uh, but visibility is a really shifting lens of, you know, um, that focus, you know, and then like getting out of focus. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's for me a paradox um, to exist in uh, multiple um, uh, frames of visibility. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we have just a few minutes left and I wanna make sure that we talk about um, the next sort of project that you and I will be collaborating on, um, which is a large installation titled Huddled Masses that you'll be presenting at the Armory Show um, through the platform section, which is a section for large scale installation and sculptures that I'm curating and Pray Shadows will be presenting this as, as part of that section. Um, and this is a piece that you had actually made and presented during the height of the pandemic so maybe there weren't a lot of folks that got a chance to see this piece. Um, so we're hoping now that, you know, in New York with the large audience that's there, it'll be a chance for uh, folks to encounter this. Um, it's definitely a very provocative title, Huddled Masses, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about this piece. Oh, sure. Um, the exhibition was called Pause, and it opened in 2020. So we literally went into the great pause. And right before that, I was thinking deeply for two years about like how technology is consuming us, you know, and our attention span is all going to our phones. And, you know, how you and I in the 20 years, actually, it's exactly when we had mobile phones. So we can talk about how being in a space together, talking with each other, was barely an email form with these clunky computers and coding <laughs> to get checklists together to the now, right, where AI and everything else is going on. So I feel like we're really looking at how technology has transformed us. And in particular, this was at the Asian um, Art Museum in San Francisco. So it was really ground zero when the pandemic hit. Um, but it was also for me thinking about Silicon Valley and the Bay Area, you know, these optimist idea of a utopia, uh, technology, internet, all of this was kind of seen as democratizing and giving access and all of that. But it's actually done the opposite, right? It's disconnected us and removed us us. Um, and of course, in the pandemic did something really strange and <laughs> disalarming, right? We all went into Zoom. <laughs> we all went into these like virtual spaces. Mm -hmm. um, um, we were homebodied, we weren't even mobile, right? So this mobile phone and the freedom that, and, and the intimacy of holding this thing was so amazing. And yet, um, I was really questioning about the larger ecological footprint of this minerals that go into making these phones and the hardware, none of it is uh, designed for recycling, you know, and we keep updating, updating, upgrading. And then, you know, this has become a dystopia uh, that we live in. Um, and these are scholars rocks. So reminiscent of, um, you know, like Zen gardens and looking at nature, but it has become our landscape, right? And um, our e-waste is just um, compounding in levels that we can not imagine. Um, and I just thought we were staring at not scholars, rocks, or even nature, but our own reflections, like a narcissistic kind of black uh, mirror. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of unfathomable. And, you know, and looking at this piece that there's a kind of, you encapsulate a sort of 20 year history of technology. I mean, so many of these, you know, uh, phones that are embedded here in the landscape that you've made are like obsolete and uh, these devices that's like, oh yeah, remember that? And I mean, that e-waste, as you said, is just mind boggling to think about. Um, and in creating, you know, this installation, which I'm really happy that people will have a chance to see, you know, within the context of the armory, you know, just feeds into the larger dialogue that you've been so attuned to for 20 years, right? This is not just something recently you've been thinking about, which is what I really appreciate about your practice is that you've been very steadfast in your attention to materiality and your attention and seeing beauty and the discarded and transfer the transformational possibilities of materials that, you know, we often may not give a, a thought to, um, that, you know, that's been a consistent um, thread uh, throughout that has just been amplified as you've used different materials and had different opportunities. Oh yeah, that's a great picture. Um, yes, and what will be nice is that now we are uh, able to gather. <laughs> and so, yes, uh, this piece will be in this amazing context, Eva. So thank you um, for bringing, you know, attention to this work and people can sit in those e-bundles um, that are going around this kind of strange garden of e-waste, um, but they're um, kind of a reliquary of our data. So people have donated like their um, laptops or their servers. And so it is a different way to preserve something 
uh, and not let it go and the physical space um, and not live in the cloud, but in this physical data. And that, but someone sitting there uh, can have different contemplations, different conversations um, to their history and the, even their archive. Well, I think we have just a few minutes left and I'm looking at the chat and I think there's a question here that we haven't addressed from Katie Walker. She asks, how do you decide to work with one material versus another like soda bottles or medical waste? Does the concept lead or does the material lead? It's just always in conversation, right? Um, so it may be that someone uh, is really interested. And, and so with my collaboration at Stanford, you know, Desiree Lebeau was like, I have to show you these. And when she gave me a tour of her lab, she was like, this is my work, you know? And she showed me these um, plaque assays, which was literally her research. And they were gorgeous, right? But no one really knows what that is and it's medical waste. Um, and so it just finds me sometimes or people point to it and suggest it. Um, and then, you know, so, plastic bottles, you know, when you're in Kenya, the one thing that is not well recycled is the water bottles because there's no market, there's no local economy, the hard plastic is recycled. So there's no place to go. So I'm, again, finding something that no one wants, and there's too much of, and there's not enough water infrastructure, right, access to clean water. Um, but that's the mosquito breeding grounds, you know, so it's all interconnected. So I just love having conversations and asking people, like, what could be helpful to you? What materials do you have a lot of that is irksome, right, is problematic, you know, then let's change that, right, to be the reason and the cause that we're putting all this work and energy toward, um, and celebration, um, not of only the problem, but actually the solutions are because we've come together and brought awareness uh, to this issue. Well, that's actually a beautiful thought to end on, actually, a notion of celebration uh, and beauty and the coming together and making these works. Um, so I want to thank you, Jean, for the gift of your work, but also for this conversation. It's been so much fun. Thank you, everyone, for logging on. Um, it was great to have you here. Um, make sure to catch the show if you can at Praise Shadows. It closes on July 23rd. And if you are in New York in early September, come by the Armory Show um, to see Huddle masses in person. Um, so thanks everyone and have a good night. Thank you, Ava. It's been a pleasure. See you at the Armory. See you at the Armory.